Shaquille O'Neal was the most brutal force in the NBA, is one of the funniest men alive, and has a net worth of $400 million. But how good was his career really? And where does he rank among the all-time best centers? Road to the NBA. Does size matter? For Shaq, his size made all the difference. At the age of three, Shaq's mother would carry his birth certificate just to prove that he was not in school yet and could ride the bus for free. Because of his size, Shaq often beat up other kids and was turning into a juvenile delinquent. He nearly got kicked out of seventh grade. The debtor in jail stereotype would have probably been his destiny if it weren't for Sergeant Philip Harrison, Shaq's stepfather. Harrison's army background and tough love were just the kind of discipline Shaq needed. Shaq would get whooped for bad behavior and Shaq and a fool on the court. Then one day when Shaq was 13, already standing at six foot seven, the size of an average NBA player, Shaq was playing basketball at the army base in Germany where Harrison was stationed. And he met Dale Brown, the head coach for the Louisiana State University. Soldier, what's your rank? Brown asked. I don't have a rank. I'm only 13, Shaq responded. Take me to your father immediately, Brown said, and offered Shaq a scholarship for LSU on the very same day. O'Neal's family then moved to Texas, where Shaq became a star for Cole High School. He led his team to a 68-1 record over two years and won the state championship as a senior. Schools everywhere were sending O'Neal scholarship offers, but he stayed loyal to LSU and Coach Brown. Then, warming up before his first game for LSU, the whole arena got quiet. Everybody was murmuring and talking about a monster that had just come out to play because Shaq was the biggest human that they had ever seen. He stood at 7 foot 1, weighing nearly 300 pounds, with a 7 foot 7 wingspan, enormous hands, and size 23 shoes. And it was hard to believe that someone that big can move so fast. Shaq had a relatively modest freshman year at LSU, but in the next two seasons, Shaq averaged 25 points, 14 rebounds, and 5 blocks. Even though Christian Leitner got selected over him to join the Dream Team in the 1992 Olympics, there was no question about who's the more talented NBA prospect. The Orlando Magic thought so too, and they selected Shaq with the first pick in the 1992 NBA Draft. The biggest kid at Disney World. Shaq was no ordinary rookie. Against the Nets, he broke the backboard, and against the Suns, he brought down the entire basket. The NBA had to change the rules and ordered all teams to strengthen their baskets to be able to withstand the Shaq attack. But Shaq was more than a powerful freak of nature. His handles were extraordinary for a man of his size, and he'd run the fast break, just like Giannis does today. O'Neal averaged 23 points, 14 rebounds, and 3.5 and blocks per game. He became the first rookie selected to the All-Star Game since Michael Jordan in 1985 and was voted Rookie of the Year almost unanimously. And because he dominated the camera and microphone just as well as he did on the court, the all-singing and all-dancing giant became a marketer's dream. After missing the playoffs by one game in his rookie year, Shaq's popularity immediately transferred his game to a movie set. He became Neon Boudot, a fictional character in Blue Chips, one of the best basketball movies ever. On the set, Shaq met Penny Hardaway, a star point guard at the University of Memphis. The duo immediately clicked and had great chemistry. Orlando had just a 0.01% chance to get the first pick in the upcoming draft, but they lucked out, and Shaq harassed the Magic management to select Penny. Shaq got his wish granted, and everyone believed they would become Magic and Kareem 2.0. In 1994, Shaq averaged 29 points per game on a league-leading 60% shooting, along with 13 rebounds and 3 blocks. He was fourth in the MVP voting, and Penny was the runner-up for Rookie of the Year. Orlando won 50 games in the regular season, but they got punched in the mouth in the playoffs. The Pacers swept Orlando, and the Magic Brass realized that they needed to add some veterans, so they signed Horace Grant and Brian Shaw. In 1995, Shaq led the NBA in scoring. Penny became an all-star. Orlando won 57 games and had the best record in the league. Once playoffs came around, they got past the Celtics and won their first playoff series in franchise history. However, nobody expected them to get past the second round, not when their opponent was the Bulls and Michael Jordan returned from baseball. MJ averaged 31 points in that series on 48% shooting, but Orlando had a better team. Their starting lineup all averaged 15 points per game or more, led by O'Neal's 24 and 13, and the Magic won the series in six games. In the conference finals, Shaq led the way to victory in the deciding game seven, and Orlando avenged their loss to the Pacers. But the fight wasn't over yet. In the finals, they'd have to play against Hakeem Olajuwon and the defending champions, the Houston Rockets. In Game 1, Orlando had a three-point lead with 10 seconds remaining. Nick Anderson was at the free-throw line, and he missed both, but got the rebound and got fouled again. 
he would go on to miss the next two as well, and Kenny Smith hit a three to send the game to overtime. In the OT, the Rockets would prevail, and this became a huge psychological failure for Orlando. Even though he played a great series offensively, Shaq couldn't stop Hakeem on the other end, and the Rockets swept the magic. O'Neal later admitted that he was still very immature during that time, and that he and teammate Dennis Scott partied for a week before the finals, instead of preparing. The 1996 Orlando was even stronger than in 95, winning 60 games in the regular season, which is still a franchise record. And they reached the conference finals, a duel with the 72-10 Chicago Bulls. With the addition of Dennis Rodman, the best supporting cast in the league, and MVP Jordan, Orlando had no chance, and they got swept. After the season, O'Neal became a free agent. Nobody thought much of it, thinking that Shaq would remain in Orlando because they had a great team. But then, the ownership started stalling with his contract negotiations, offering O'Neal less money than he wanted. And after 85% of readers in the Orlando Sentinel said that O'Neal is not worth $100 million, Shaq's ego couldn't take it, and he wanted out. So Jerry West swooped in and lured Shaq to LA with a big contract, bright Hollywood lights, and one brash 18-year-old shooting guard. La La Land. Shaq's personality was made for LA. He was rapping, making movies, and hanging out with celebrities. But even though he was delivering his usual numbers and led the NBA in field goal percentage, the Lakers weren't very successful and were getting swept in the playoffs. The general public started to wonder if Shaq is truly a great player and if he was committed to winning. After the 1999 season, they hired a six-time NBA champion head coach, Phil Jackson. In the offseason, Shaq was no longer making bad movies and partying. For once, he spent his summer in the gym, got into the best shape of his life. O'Neal led the NBA in scoring and field goal percentage, with nearly 30 points, 14 rebounds, 4 assists, and 3 blocks on average. He was just one vote shy of becoming the first unanimous MVP in NBA history. That regular season in 2000, the Lakers won 67 games, which was the fifth best result ever. It seemed like they would sleepwalk through the West and get to the finals, but the Portland Trailblazers had other plans. In Game 7 of the Conference Finals, Portland had a 15-point lead in the fourth quarter, and it looked like Shaq was going to swallow another bitter pill. But all of a sudden, the Blazers kept missing. And with one minute to go, Kobe threw an alley-oop to Shaq, which completed the comeback, and became arguably the most memorable play in Lakers history. The Lakers did it. They were in the finals against the Pacers, and Shaq was on a mission. Despite a formidable resistance from Reggie Miller and Jalen Rose, they couldn't do anything against O'Neal, who averaged 38 points and 17 rebounds in the series. The Lakers won in six games, and Shaq was finally an NBA champion. But Diesel was satisfied with winning one championship, and he went back to his chilling and partying all summer. So coming into training camp out of shape, Kobe Bryant was pissed, and their relationship started to deteriorate. While Shaq was shedding the extra pounds, Kobe became the Lakers' new best player. And even though the Lakers won 11 games less than the previous year, everything still clicked towards the playoffs. They swept the entire Western Conference, and everybody expected them to do the same against the Sixers in the finals. Until Allen Iverson played one of the best games in finals history. He scored 48 points in the Staples Center, stepped over Tyron Liu, and stole game one for the Sixers. However, this only pissed Shaq off, so even though he was guarded by the Defensive Player of the Year, Dikembe Mutombo, Shaq came back on another level. O'Neal averaged 33 points, 16 rebounds, 5 assists, and 3.5 and blocks, and the Lakers won the next four games and the championship. In 2002, Shaq and Kobe and the Lakers continued their dominance. But this year, there was finally a worthy opponent, the number one seed Sacramento Kings. The Kings played the best basketball all year long, and they had what it took to dethrone the Lakers. But with some bad luck and arguably the worst officiating in NBA history, Sacramento couldn't deliver the final punch. And the Lakers advanced to the finals, where they swept the Nets. O'Neal averaged 36, 12, and 4, and won his third consecutive finals MVP. In 2003, Tim Duncan and the Spurs proved to be too strong for the Lakers, which is why in 2004, LA added Karl Malone and Gary Payton to form a super team. And even though they were the best team on paper, the Lakers grew extremely dysfunctional. Shaq feuded with Jerry Buss over a new contract and complained about Kobe. Shaq said Kobe was selfish and didn't throw him the ball enough, so Kobe responded by calling O'Neal fat and lazy. But despite all the turmoil, the Lakers were still so talented and they reached another NBA Finals, 
However, the lack of team chemistry showed its ugly head when it was most important. Kobe was forcing things, and Shaq was successfully guarded by Ben Wallace, which was the first time in several years a player could contain Shaq one-on-one. -on -one. Detroit defeated LA in five games, and it was the end of the road for Shaq and Kobe, whose relationship got bad beyond repair. The Lakers didn't want to lose Kobe, and Shaq was too expensive for their taste, so they traded Big Diesel to Miami. South Beach Shaq ballooned to nearly 400 pounds at the end of his Lakers days. That wasn't going to fly with Pat Riley and Miami's 10% body fat policy. So for the 2005 season, Big Diesel got to 320 pounds, wanting to show the Lakers that they should have chosen him over Kobe. He finished second in the MVP race behind Steve Nash, and he's still salty about it. But the Heat had the number one seed and swept their first two playoff series. However, in the conference finals, the Pistons edged them in seven games. Shaq couldn't let that slide, and in 2006, Miami got back at the Pistons. This time, it was Miami who advanced to the finals, for the first time in franchise history. However, the championship was looking unattainable for the Heat against the Mavericks. Dallas had a 2-0 lead and a big advantage in the fourth quarter of Game 3. Thanks to D-Wade, the Heat pulled off an upset and brought the dream back to life. Then, out of nowhere, Miami turned the tables and went on to win the next three games and the series. Shaq was clearly second fiddle to Wade, but he delivered on his promise and brought a championship parade to South Beach. But next season, as usual, drama followed Shaq, and he nearly fought Pat Riley at practice. His days in Miami were numbered. In 2009, he was named the All-Star MVP together with Kobe, and that was the last highlight of his career. Shaq spent the last couple of years trying to chase a ring next to LeBron in Cleveland and with Boston's Big Three. But Big Diesel was getting older and heavier, so after his Achilles broke in the 2011 playoffs, he was forced to retire from the NBA. Legacy Shaq was a terrible free throw shooter, and he didn't work hard during practice. He partied like a rock star, and he could have been much better defensively. Phil Jackson said that he was the laziest superstar ever, and that his 2000 MVP year was the only season Shaq was ever in shape. O'Neal's ego also made him clash with teammates and coaches often. But for the first 14 years of his career, Shaq averaged 26 points, 12 rebounds, 3 assists, and 2.5 and blocks. He led the league in field goal percentage. 10 times and won four championships with three finals MVPs and one regular season MVP. If we're talking about the best centers ever, Kareem was the only one who had individual accolades and team success that can match Shaq. And yes, Hakeem was a better shooter and a better defender, and the same is true for David Robinson. Bill Russell has more championships, and Wilt had better individual stats. However, none of those great centers were as dominant as Shaq was in his prime because there was nobody at his size that moved that fast, ever, not even Wilt. Between 2000 and 2002, O'Neal averaged 30 points, 15 rebounds, and three blocks in the playoffs. Kobe was great in everything, but Shaq was the main problem for every Lakers opponent during that era. Many say that if Shaq had an approach to basketball like Kobe, he could have won 10 titles and five MVPs. Yeah, Shaq could have worked harder, but he did it his way and had arguably the most fun out of any NBA player ever. Shaq was enjoying life to the fullest, and he still won four titles and six trips to the NBA Finals. He still ranks among the five best centers ever and among the 20 best players in NBA history. Can you dig it?